Thank you, Jordan. I'm Rachel Glass. I'm the first vice chair. I will be introducing the candidates to you tonight. Councilman Lisa Herbold has been a Highland Park resident for 19 years and Seattle resident for 27 years. She served as council member Nick Lakata's legislative aide since coordinating his 1997 campaign. Lisa was elected to the city council in 2015 and serves District 1, West Seattle and South Park. Before her public service at Seattle City Hall, Lisa worked in a capacity always focused on her community's greatest needs. From Syracuse to Chicago to Seattle, as a campus director, a staffer at a homeless person's shelter, an executive assistant for a low-income housing developer, a neighborhood organizer, and a tenant organizer, Lisa has always invested her time empowering working-class communities to speak truth to power. Phil Tavel has been a physics teacher, co-founded a video game company, was a pro temp judge in the King County District Court, and has served as a public defender for the past 14 years. Phil is the vice president of the Morgan Community Association, sits on the Southwest Precinct Advisory Council, is on the board of directors of the Seattle Green Spaces Coalition, and is the vice president of the board of Allied Arts. Brendan Colding has resided in District 1 since 2009. A former lieutenant with the Seattle Police Department, Brendan has been an active member of the community, coaching YMCA basketball and serving as president of the Holy Rosary School Commission. He lives in the Delridge neighborhood with his wife and three young children. Jesse Green was born in Seattle and raised in a small suburb of Sumner. He attended undergraduate school at Seattle Central and Washington State University and graduate school at Seattle University. Jesse moved to West Seattle 17 years ago. He currently owns Uncle Woody's Popcorn Products and Above and Beyond Construction and he currently serves on the State Advisory Council of Homelessness as an advisory to Governor Jay Inslee. Jesse is a firm believer in progressing democratic values, and in our district, he serves as the welcome chair for the 34th LD Democrats and as a PCO for his Alpine neighborhood. Welcome to all our candidates tonight. We will now uh, have opening statements. Two minutes each, and we'll start with Council Member Herbold. So Seattle has led the nation in growth, population growth among big cities. We also, um, in addition to growth and added job creation, we have had record numbers of visitors to our city for the last nine years, 40 million visitors this year. And we face the problems of prosperity that not all are sharing. Up until a year ago, Seattle led the nation in rent increases, over 60% in rent increases since 2020. We know from a Zillow study that 5% of rent increases um, will result specifically in Seattle in an additional 250 people who are homeless. These are the challenges that we have to deal with. I've made my life a life of public service. And I believe that I've served this community um, both by fulfilling my, my campaign promises. If you take a look at my website, there are over 15 pages of campaign promises, 70 accomplishments fulfilled. These are accomplishments that I was able to identify and work on and see through because of you, because of the voters in this district, identifying these priorities. And I have the endorsements of the Service Employees International Union Local 6, who are janitors and security guards. I also have the endorsement of the National Women's Political Caucus, as well as Senator Joan Nguyen, Councilmember Lorena Gonzalez, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, because they know I will be a consistent voice pushing the city to make a commitment to address these issues for affordability for all, not just make the commitment for back it up. Hello again. Oh, my name is Philip Tavel. I have uh, lived 
lived here in West Seattle for 20 years. I currently live in Arbor Heights. My son attends Arbor Heights Elementary School. I've uh, lived down on Alki and in the Morgan Junction, and I love this town. I love Seattle. I love West Seattle. And my feeling is we can do better. I think right now we're looking at a city with a lot of issues. You know, four years ago I ran for this position, and I have not seen a significant improvement in any of the things we were talking about four years ago. We have a burgeoning homeless issue, we have property taxes rising, the cost of living is an issue here, and on and on. There are so many things that we need to address. Now, tonight as you're listening, and I say thank you all for coming out, I mean, this kind of turnout is fantastic, because these elections are so important. We are going to set the tone for the next four years, and we really are at a crossroads at this point where we need to have new leadership and new ideas and new people speaking out to deal with the issues we have. And so, to that end, you need to listen tonight to all of us, to all of our answers. You know, not just the first few seconds that we thought of, but all two minutes. Everything we have to say. Because with an issue like this in this city, where we're facing new problems every day, and the issue is what we're facing that we know are bad right now, we don't know the next ones to come down the road. And to that extent, we need people with other experiences, life experiences. I've been a physics teacher, I've been a business owner, I've owned a store, I've been a pro town judge, I've been a uh, public defender for the last 14 years. And the fact is, we need that. We need new skill, new experience to deal with these issues. So I say to you, take your time, listen to all of us, listen to what we have to say. Come and meet us afterwards, talk to us, look at our websites, look at our literature, and attend events like this, because this is an incredibly important time. We need to get it right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. It's, it's so very inspiring to see so many people willing to come out to an event like this on a Wednesday night. This is an important opportunity for people to learn about the issues and about the candidates, and it gives you a good chance to uh, start to work on making the choice that you'll need to make in August as, as to whom, for, for whom you're going to vote in the primary. My name is Brendan Colvin, and I'm running because I want to represent you on Seattle City Council. I had a career with the city for over a decade that I feel um, gives me a unique set of skills and qualifications to serve as a council member. I worked for the police department for over 10 years. As a patrol officer, I actually did do a training rotation here in the Southwest Precinct, but most of my time was in the North Precinct and in the West Precinct, which is downtown. I also spent five and a half years in the policy unit. I worked there as we were developing policies related to the city's consent decree with the Department of Justice. I was involved in the development of the policies related to use of force, stops and detentions, bias-free policing, early intervention, crisis intervention, and others that got us into initial compliance early in uh, 2018, and hopefully will get us into full compliance with the settlement agreement in uh, early next year. Um, I've also, through that job, uh, gained experience with the Seattle process of policy development, working with myriad stakeholders to implement policies that meet their needs and meet the needs of the community. I also have a very unique familiarity with the issues we're, we're looking at in terms of homelessness and public safety. I've been boots on the ground uh, related to these issues. I know the people who are working on them now. I'm uh, uniquely experienced in that respect. And I'm also very aware of the issues that the SPD is facing in terms of staffing. We are at crisis. Um, and a strong part of my motivation for running for this office is to support the officers and, and uh, make them want to stay here in Seattle. And to that end, I'm, just, I'm running to introduce smart government to our city, and I uh, really appreciate you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. My name is Jesse Green. I was born in Seattle. I first moved here 17 years ago. I'm currently a small business owner in South Park, and I'm a statewide advocate for homeless. This run, this, is, this has been a crazy ride, so I want to keep it simple and talk about the three reasons why I'm running for City Council. Heck, they help help convince my wife, so I'm hoping it helped convince all of you that I should be here. The first reason I'm running is my passion for this community. I'm not a career politician. I feel the need to serve, because like many of you, I fell in love with Seattle. I fell in love with the people here in West Seattle before I fell in love with Alki or Lincoln Park or any of the places. I love this community because it embraces diversity, art, 
culture, and music. The second reason I'm running is because of my experience. Right now in Seattle, we're facing an unprecedented challenge around affordability and a homeless crisis. I currently serve on the State Advisory Council of Homelessness to Governor Inslee. I'm prepared to tackle this issue, and to be honest, I believe our current council has missed the mark. The other reason I'm running is because of my lived experience. My experience with homelessness is not just a leadership policy. It's deeply personal. I experienced homelessness when my mom was escaping domestic violence. My father struggled and died from opiates. I've seen the complexities of these issues firsthand. I also understand homelessness can be escaped. And why is that? Because I am I was fortunate enough to go to Seattle Central WSU graduate school at Seattle University. I know Seattle can be better being progressive, compassionate, and accountable because I have lived it. If you're looking for a city council member with passion for this community, experience on policy, and will use lived experience to bring much needed perspective to city council, I ask for the opportunity to earn all of your support. Thank you. So uh, we're going to start with our first question, which is addressing the issue of housing. With the passage of mandatory housing affordability, what is the next step toward increasing our affordable housing stock? What will District 1 gain? So it's a two-part question. And uh, we will start with uh, Mr. Tabak. Uh, so one of the things with MHA that I hope happens is that we actually do get some of the affordable housing that's supposed to be built. And obviously one of the issues that I actually have with it is the fact that I don't think the in of fees are high enough with MHA. I don't think that there's enough of an incentive for developers to give us the affordable housing where we actually get the added development. And that is definitely a concern for me. And it's something I'd like to address because obviously there's an opportunity here with upzoning this city, and especially within the urban villages, to have developers come along and pay into a fee for us to get the affordable housing we need. But one of the problems is it's not just about building more. It's about preserving some of the affordable housing we already have. I know a lot of people, as I've gone around talking in West Seattle, who live in buildings that are older buildings that have affordable rents, and the problem is that if they get torn down all over the place, what comes back up is not going to be as affordable as what was there previously. So I am concerned that we aren't necessarily set up with MHA to give us what we need. Because obviously, if you look at the property tax increases, if you look at the rent increases, if you look at just the general property values around the city, it's exploded. And one of the big problems there is we get left without enough affordable housing. And so I'm happy that there's a plan to have money there for affordable housing to be built, especially for not-for-profit developers, but I think we need to do a lot more. That in order to get this issue under control and be able to provide worker-level housing, things that middle-class families can afford, you know, places to be within an urban village and not get priced out of it, there's a lot that we have to look at other than just MHA. So one of the things I actually intend to do is to look to ways, like I said, to preserve some of our affordable housing stock now, but to use these funds in a better way to give us the affordable housing we need. Thank you. I appreciate this question. I um, feel that the MHA really needs to be revisited. We need to make sure that the that the increased density we're creating with upzoning retains more affordable housing than we appear to be uh, retaining at this point. I read something earlier today that the uh, there would only be something like nine additional units in, uh, in the junction area, which just isn't uh, acceptable. I think the next step, in addition to that, though, is we have the opportunity with the uh, with the Sound Transit line uh, to develop in a very intentional manner. If we're able to get a tunnel under, under the junction area, as has been recommended, we have the opportunity to create kind of a second wave of upzoning, which hopefully will, will um, retain more affordable housing uh, for people who will have easy access to their transit to get to work. Um, the other thing that, uh, that is important about that is 
in response to the second part of the question, what will District 1 gain? District 1 will gain the opportunity to retain a lot of its more traditional character as being kind of a, an accessible place for people who want to live in the city. That's um, what attracted me to it when I moved here about 10 years ago. It was a place where my wife and I could afford to purchase a home when I actually didn't even make six figures yet. It was um, a place that had a lot of character. And so as far as what we stand to gain, I think we stand to, to retain our more traditional identity with that. So thank you. So I very much support additional funding for affordable and low-income housing. But we also need middle-income housing. We have an issue here with the city. It takes $160,000 in income to qualify for the average market rate house right now. And that is with no expenses. So for me, the thing is, is that we need to manage the housing inventory. We need additional housing. This is something that we've mismanaged for over a decade. And so I'm troubled by some of the parts of MHA. I'm troubled by the number of developers that choose paying a fine. Integrating responsible, affordable housing into our communities, that needs to be a priority. Sometimes making impact doesn't mean the money needs to go to the city. We need to ask and partner with developers to have them integrate those housing units in the housing units that they're building so that we're not developing big surplus of funds and building housing that are strictly to place people in at-risk communities. District 1, what it has to gain, High Point, South Park. These are neighborhoods that are next for gentrification. We need to make sure that everyone has access to affordable living. And so, yeah, we need affordable housing. We haven't done a good job of it. And we need to make sure that we dedicate time and effort in affordable housing, but also middle income housing. Thanks. So I'm glad to hear that everybody here is in support of building more affordable housing. Um, also, I just want to note that as it relates specifically to the mandatory housing affordability program, I wholeheartedly agree with folks um, up here who uh, say that it's really important that the housing be built in this community. That's why the framework legislation says it's a goal that 50% of developers will perform, which means they will include the, um, the affordable units in their development. And if they don't, the council is going to look at it again. We're going to turn the fee to create a disincentive to just pay into the fee. We also have a really good track record in the city of investing dollars in the neighborhoods from where they derive. We already have something called the incentive zoning uh, program, and we use those dollars from increased capacity and invest them in affordable housing in the areas where that, those buildings are being built. So we've got a, a really, actually, a good track record of investing those dollars. The problem is we're not investing enough dollars. The city just issued what's um, uh, called a request for intents to apply to our nonprofit housing developers. And this year, like many years before, there were $200 million <coughs> worth of applications from our housing providers, projects that are ready to go. We're going to have half that much available, if that. We usually give about $80 million a year. We need to ramp up our investment in affordable housing. Stationary development, yes, absolutely. Um, using money from our hotel, hotel tax authority, I work with King County Council, including Council Member um, Joe Dermott here, as well as other council members, to make sure that a lot of the dollars there are going to be going into affordable housing. As it relates to stationary planning, we um, worked with the uh, neighborhood in the West Seattle Junction to make a commitment to have those conversations about including extra density um, around a, a proposed station area. And the thing that's so great about transit-oriented development is that the state requires that 80% of the housing be available for 80% affordable AMA, AMI. So that is getting to that middle-income housing right around there. We can't give funds, actually, for middle-income housing. There's a prohibition of, of getting the public funds. So that's why our money has to go for affordable housing. Question two is on the environment, and we will start with Brandon Golden. According to data released by the state's Department of Health, 
Seattle is severely impacted by exposure to pollutants. Seattle has also shown vulnerability to climate change. If elected, how would you improve the city's environmental health, sustainability, and resiliency in the face of these concerns? Thank you. This is certainly an important topic, and it hits District 1 uh, more so than any other region of the city. South Park is um, obviously part of District 1, and it's the most, one of the most polluted neighborhoods in the state. It's certainly the most polluted in the city. Um, there's data that shows that the life expectancy in South Park is 13 years lower than it is in Laurelhurst. Uh, that's because of a couple of different factors. One, it's on the Duwamish, which is a designated Superfund site for pollution. It's also experienced a lot of pollution due to the fact that it's just kind of a high traffic industrial area. Um, so I think that the major change, well, what we need to do is we need to continue to work on improving that. We need to support the efforts of our partners in the nonprofit sector who have been working very hard on this topic. Uh, the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and the Environmental Co Coalition of South Seattle have been kind of taking the lead on that, from what I understand. We need to make sure we um, encourage them as they do that. Um, we also need to make sure we're taking advantage of all efforts to, um, to be responsible with our, with our emissions as a city, both in terms of uh, as, as a corporate entity with our own fleet. I know the city of Seattle's been making a lot of very intentional moves toward uh, reducing gas emissions through, through its vehicles. We also need to encourage um, businesses within the city to uh, make sure they're not uh, polluting any more than they really have to be. Uh, because this is something, obviously, we can't, we can't take back. Once we've over-polluted, we've, uh, it, it'll be hard to take back. To take back. So, uh, and like I said, it's, very, it's a very real issue here in District 1, so it's something that we need to continue to support efforts toward uh, mediating. Thank you. So tackling the environment in two minutes, Jordan, I don't know if this is quite fair, but we're gonna go ahead and have, go after this thing. Um, I'm part of the South Park Neighborhood Association. Uncle Woody's is located in South Park, and you are correct. We have a lot of need of cleanup of not only the Duwamish, which is a super fun site. So first of all, please come out on Earth Day and come help us do that, but we need to continue to encourage as a city that we're doing everything that we can to ensure that we're not polluting the Duwamish or the Puget Sound with garbage, with runoff, and that we are mitigating those pieces where we can. Uh, the number one contributor to pollutants that cause global warming is transportation. We need to continue to focus on a city of having clean transportation solution, clean transportation. All of our vehicles need to start moving towards electric vehicles. Seattle, City light energy is some of the cleanest in the entire nation and it's carbon neutral. We need to take advantage of that as a city. Also on the business side, there's things called energy management systems. They're a very important piece and what it does is it ensures that businesses do their part to conserve energy and use it appropriately. There's parts where we can, we can partner with our business is to ensure that we are keeping carbon emissions low. There's more that we need to do in this. I mean, there's no question that this is the biggest issue over the long term for us to deal with. We need to ensure that Seattle's not only a great place for all of us to live, it's a great place for my kids and my grandkids and my grand grandkids after I'm long gone. So, we need to be paramount. We have the intellectual capital here in Seattle. We have some of the best minds here. We can do this. We just need to work together. So um, we know that 60% of emissions um, get greenhouse gases, come from emissions, come from transportation emissions. And the best way that we can address that is by focusing on our transportation investments and making sure that those transportation investments are actually being used uh, for modes of transportation that um, decrease the number of single occupancy vehicle trips. So in my, from my perspective, the uh, economic development investment in what I call the shopping shuttle, the, the 
downtown streetcar isn't actually a good, wise use of precious transportation dollars in a way that is actually going to reduce vehicle trips. We need to be using those dollars for the kinds of infrastructure, transportation infrastructure that actually get people out of the cars. And so that's things like making sure that we are improving our bus service in District 1. Um, my office independently did an analysis of bus service to, for instance, Admiral, and found that even by the city's own stats, by its own measures, Admiral was being poorly served. We got more bus service for Admiral. Likewise, we got more bus service for Delridge, the 120, the 131. Um, and um, we're also working with SPU. We're, the, we're um, working to do two things with SPU. One, to require a change in the building code so that uh, recycling facilities are avail more available for apartment dwellers. That's an area that really needs improvement. And we are also um, are leading the city in beginning to switch its fleet over, its garbage and recycling truck fleet over to electric vehicles. Um, I've been working on doing that, and shout out to Alex Murray who's been helping me. Um, finally, the, um, the other thing that I think is really important is we have not updated our climate action plan to identify goals, um, goals that we can make sure that we're meeting in order to meet the obligation of the, um, the Paris Climate Accord. Thank you. Uh, obviously, I mean, we in District 1 are very fortunate that we have tremendous environmental resources here that we do need to protect. We've got South Park and North Delridge are two areas where there are tremendous issues with air quality and also that ends up affecting things like life expectancy. Part of that, we need to embrace more of what we have. Like down in South Park, we've got the only working farm in the city of Seattle. This is something that we need to look at possibly expanding, look at how urban farming could work things we could do to help it. I know there's a project going on actually in South Park that we really need to support to help bring back more of the native plants that are down in South Park and create greener spaces, because obviously the plants are one of the things that help us scrub our atmosphere. And the more we clear these out and the less that we spend time focusing on our open space and green spaces, we're going to lose that. We're going to lose that asset, and it's something that impacts us negatively on the environmental side. Like, for example, we need to make sure that we protect the Myers wetland. We've got the Ham Watershed there that provides clean water into the Duwamish, which obviously still is a super fun site. We're still cleaning that up. And now, with Terminal 5 expanding and getting to open itself up, we're going to be dredging there. And so even more, we've got to protect how the clean water is getting into the Duwamish that helps, you know, that basically helps it stay that way, but helps push us in the direction of being able to clean it up. So we need to look at the projects that we've got going on. We need to make sure that they're environmentally intelligent, but we need to protect the resources that we do have. Granted, transportation is a huge part of it. I mean, one of the things nobody ever talks about is the carbon footprint from air traffic. I mean, 660,000 flights a year coming in and out of SeaPAC Airport, and over the next 20 years, that's looking to double. But to be honest, that's a separate issue from District 1's environmental resources. And like I said, we need to do as much as we can to add green space, add open space, protect what we have, and be good environmental stewards in our neighborhood. Because we're not, we're going to lose it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Our next question is going to address health care. In the King County Community Health Needs Assessment for 2018 and 2019, one, access to health care and preventative services. Two, mental health services. Three, treatment for chemical dependency. Four, pregnancy and birth services. Five, physical activity, nutrition, and weight services. And six, violence and injury prevention were all identified as areas needing improvement. What will you do as a council member to ensure the people of Seattle have access to the care they need? And we'll start with Jesse. Thank you, Rachel. And again, two minutes, not enough to cover all of those. But we're going to go ahead and give it a try. Uh, we do need to make sure we have access. And I am really proud of some of the work that we have going on in Olympia. For example, Eileen Cody is She's spearheading the effort for Cascade Care, and I'm really excited for this because it allows people to buy in 
to our healthcare system. It is a step towards single payer. It gives people access, and we need to continue to make sure that everyone has access to the needs of healthcare services. On the mental health issues, talking with Eileen, we have over 500 available beds here at local area hospitals that are not currently staffed. Why are we not helping? Why are we not financing the staffing of those to go after the mental health needs? Dependency. This is a piece, this is a piece that is near to my heart. All of us have Im been impacted by the drug epidemic that we have here within this city. We need to do better. And doing better means that we provide on-demand services, on-demand help for everyone that wants to give up Everyone who feels like they don't have a way out, we need to show them that there is solutions. There is ways we can help. We can provide opiate blockers, we can provide methadone, we can give solutions to help wean them off of this because this is a huge blight within this city. A lot of times, homelessness is confused with the drug epidemic because there are a lot of homeless users that we see downtown that have drug dependency issues. We need to do better because this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to see people feel like there's no other way out. We need to make sure on-demand services, access and for mental health and drug dependency issues is available to everyone. Someone shows up with a mental health issue 
and there's no bed for it. Now there's going to be a lot of space. Now granted, it's still just 180, and we need to do a lot more. Um, one of the things we need to look at is back in how the 70s and 80s, we pretty much destroyed the idea of having inst institutionalization for mental health problems, and now we're seeing mental health problems with just people on the street with it. So we have to move forward, but what UW has done is a really good step towards that. Um, in terms of the other things with respect to like pregnancy and birth and nutrition, we, we can do better with just education, with getting out there, getting into schools, talking about what we can do, and making things more affordable. The city can find ways to augment people's ability to pay for these services. And so there are lots of other issues out there. Like I also support building up the co-op in the Delaware neighborhood because we have to address, the, address those issues as well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I agree that two minutes is, is not sufficient to totally uh, tackle all these issues, but I'll do the best I can. Uh, the one thing for access that, that isn't always addressed that concerns me the most is, yes, we have world-class hospitals in the city. We're very fortunate to have them. But in the event of a natural disaster, like when Seattle Bridge goes down, we're kind of, we're literally on an island out here. Uh, so I want to make sure we have a plan for being able to transport people to the other side of I-5 in the event that that becomes necessary. Also, I agree that we do have food deserts. I happen to live in one. Uh, we own a van that allows us to go shopping for healthier options, but otherwise you're stuck with uh, gas stations if walking is your only option. And so we need to, we need to be able to place our uh, grocery stores strategically and uh, fairly and equitably within the city. Uh, mental health is, me mental health and chemical dependency are our biggest concerns really in the entire country right now. I think everybody can accept that. Uh, mental health had been stigmatized for so long that people weren't, it was, it was a, uh, it, it seemed to be a problem to actually pursue the services you needed for mental health. And that's trickled down to where we have people on the streets who are not getting the services they need. We need to prioritize that, we need to properly fund that, we need to make sure we can guarantee those services. For chemical dependency, one of the issues we have is that the, the same RCW that allows people, that allows the police to uh, commit to conduct an involuntary treatment for people mental health issues has recently been revised uh, to allow them to do that for substance abuse issues, but only if there's an available bed. If we don't have an available bed, we can't help them get the help they need if they aren't willing to do it voluntarily. That's why we need to be able to facilitate that better. Uh, also, we talk about violence and injury prevention. People are being victimized on the streets of Seattle because we have a crime problem. Uh, I think one of the things we need to do is we need to properly support our police department and allow them to go out and enforce the law and preempt a lot of these, these victimizations that are happening. Question four is on addiction, and we'll start with Council Member Perfect. In their 2017 NW report, King County's Heroin and Prescription Opiate Addiction Task Force reported a 300% increase in the number of deaths from heroin overdose since 2009. They also identified medically assisted treatment as the most effective method for reducing the risk of death by overdose. A pilot program conducted by the Swedish Family Medicine Clinic found that 78% of participants reported an interest in reducing or stopping their heroin or opiate use. Given the clear health risks of addiction, the trial of programs which have proven effective, and the efforts of many suffering from addiction to get help, what programs would you do implement? to reduce the prevalence of heroin and opiates in Seattle? Thank you, great question. So um, there are many different um, things that we need to do um, to address um, addiction in our city and in our region. Um, we, we heard mention of involuntary treatment. There is new authority in, uh, given granted by the state legislature, um, but involuntary treatment is really the, uh, the last resort um, response. It's a crisis response, um, and the bar is pretty high for when we can use it. We have to establish that somebody is a danger to themselves or, or another person. Um, and we can only use it once we have treatment beds, of which we don't have um, a facility here in King County. There's going to be one coming on later this year. But what we do need is we need treatment on demand. Um, we really need to ramp up the availability of it. You should not have to be facing uh, criminal charges. Um, in our uh, legal system in order to access treatment. Um, we 
also need to make sure that King County is fully funding, as I understand that they're planning on doing medical assisted uh, treatment. Um, medical assisted treatment is really important, particularly for people who are um, who are incarcerated. Um, and um, in in uh, another sort of a, of a facility, they, they they need that assistance. Um, and we need to uh, also recognize that if you're talking about people who have addiction um, and are um, have have other issues like are criminally justice involved or are homeless, that there are different interventions that are that are really necessary and critical. Um, a new study released by the University of Washington shows that based on current Seattle overdose rates, that a safe injection site annually would reverse 167 overdoses, would reverse 90 ER visits every year, it would save six lives, and every dollar spent would save $4. And if it saves the life of a loved one, it will be priceless. We are absolutely in the middle of an opioid crisis. I mean, there's a reason why the American Medical Association has created a new board of certification in the opioid crisis, and because it's just rampant. It's issues from people treating mental health issues on their own on the street, and to people who are just ending up on the street, and it just escalates. They start with one drug, move to another, move to another. I know in 15 years as a public defender, I've seen this, and I've seen how it destroys people, how it destroys families, and so there are a few things that we need to do. Number one, we need a stronger safety net within the criminal justice system. When someone comes in front of a judge and they've been arrested, and at the root of their problem is a drug issue, and heroin and meth are two of the things that lead to tremendous problems with the criminal justice system. And we need to support our drug court and our mental health court in this city a lot better than we're doing now. And also, we need to work on making sure it's something that people want to get into. Because obviously, one of the biggest issues is the voluntary nature of it. That a lot of people, when they're in the throes of an addiction, their first thought is not, I absolutely want to get off it. It's, I want to get the next drug. And so we need to help that. A big part of helping that is having a much more community-oriented approach to this. We need community-based detox instead of just medical-based detox. We need programs that can help people. One of the things out there is Narcan. You know, this is this is something that actually stop an overdose and keep someone alive, and yet Big Pharma is charging insane amounts of money to have that. This is something that we need available to more people. It needs to be available so that when someone is in crisis like that and overdosing, something can be done. But in general, we just need to look at the overall focus of how we're attacking the opioid crisis, identifying people in trouble, and getting them into a place where they excuse me, where they've got support. And so for that, we need to look to expand the services we have now and train people who are out there as first responders to be able to deal with this. Thanks. Thank you. If I could sum a decade plus worth of law enforcement experience up into three words, it would be drugs are bad. And I'm not even being facetious. Drugs ruin people's lives, they ruin communities. We've seen the impact out on our streets. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have a tool, we have a legal tool we can use to get people the assistance they need if they won't do it voluntarily, and that is, in, and that is through the Involuntary Treatment Act. There are many situations where people out on the streets are under the influence or are suffering from their addiction, and the police could articulate that they're a danger to themselves, they're a danger to others, they're a danger to property, or they're gravely disabled. Just one of those prongs is what you need, but without the facility to actually send them to, you can't affect the seizure. And that's not a criminal charge. That's, what's, that's a seizure under what's called community caretaking. So you don't need to be plugged into the criminal justice system to get the help. You just need a bed for this person. So we need to be able to get facilities that are funded for that purpose. Uh, also, people who want to voluntarily avail themselves of these facilities should be able to do so. Once we have good services, that, that will do a lot to help. Also, uh, Mr. Tavlin mentioned Narcan. It's also called Naloxone. That's a, that's a good tool that should be readily available. Uh, the SPD and, and Seattle Fire have it. They use it uh, pretty much on a daily basis. It saved many lives. Uh, this is another thing where if we support law enforcement and we have officers on the ground proactively doing police work, they can actually preempt a lot of the sales. Part of how we got into this opioid crisis was as um, pres prescription painkillers became overly prescribed, people got hooked and the cartels uh, from further south were aware of this and actually adjusted their product so that it would be uh, less
less expensive and cheaper and more attainable for people. That's a lot, a lot that has a lot to do with how we got into this. Also, I am 100% against heroin injection sites. They're counterproductive. We've seen uh, negative impacts from them. And with time right now, I'll just say thank you. Thank you. And you want to come out right away and say, I am opposed to safe injection sites. And I'm not necessarily, I'm not necessarily against the fundamental idea of them. Um, but the research isn't in, it's, it's not there. Uh, I'm troubled by the findings that we found from safe injection sites. If you take um, Insight, for example, which is the one in Vancouver downtown, um, it sh has shown mixed results and it suggests that there may not prevent HIV infection, infections. Um, there's also been 1,300 deaths last year in British Columbia. We haven't seen a proven decrease in the usage of it. And if you go to the east side of downtown, in downtown Vancouver, that's the choice we get to make right now. Do we want to have blighted parts of the city where they actually say welcome to hell when you go into that part of the city? And I'm talking from a place of compassion. These people need help. The people that are addicted to these drugs, they're trying to escape. They're trying to escape the sadness that they have. But that's why it's so important. It's so important for us to have treatment on demand. I have no idea why we currently don't have a better solution. This is something that we've been dealing with as a city for years now. We should have already had this implemented. Right away, we need to make sure that we go in and that we use statistically proven data to help people get off of drugs. We need to prevent one more death. So Narcan does need to be made available, and I love that our first responders have it, but it needs to be available to everyone, because if someone isn't alive, we can't save them. Thanks, everyone. Our next question is going to address public safety. In a citywide survey conducted by Seattle Police Department, community groups, and Seattle University, a lack of police was the primary public safety concern. How do you plan to recruit and retain law enforcement personnel so our communities feel safer? Well, yes, we... Sorry, Mr. Talbot, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, we clearly have an issue with staffing. I mean, we think about the fact that in 1968, we had 1,000 police officers in Seattle. In 2019, we have 1,000 police officers in Seattle. We have grown by 60%, over 300,000 people in that time, and we have the same staffing. You know, a friend of mine took a look at a list of per capita police uh, uh, enforcement in this country to see where Seattle ranked, and we have the same per capita police coverage in Seattle as Milford, Connecticut. And to me, that says we don't have enough police officers. You look at Boston, a similarly sized city, they've got 1,600 police officers there. Now, obviously, a big part of this is how do we draw police officers here? How do we retain police officers? One of the things we need to do is be more supportive of them. We need a council, we need a mayor's office that is more supportive of the police. I've talked to plenty of them. In my job as a public defender, and sitting on the Southwest Precinct Advisory Council, morale is incredibly low in the police department. They have issues affording to live here. They have issues with the fact that they feel that crimes are going uncharged. There are lots of different issues, and so we need to find ways to properly staff, which means increasing pay, which is something we've worked on. Um, we do also need to not vote against getting money back from the federal government to pay the police for the work that they've done. And we need to be careful of that. We need to make sure that we're incentivizing them and we're maybe finding ways to get them more affordable housing to have them here. But the fact is, we have an issue of not having enough police on our streets to do the job based on the size of the city and we are just going to grow. We need to address this issue now and a big part of that is working with the police department, working with the police union to ask them what are the things they need, what are the tools they need from the city, and the city just needs to provide that so that we can have proper police coverage so that we can keep people safe. Thank you. 
I had the honor of serving on the SPD for 10 years as an officer, as a detective, as a sergeant, and as a lieutenant. Um, and I can tell you staffing and morale are about as low as they can get, but they're continuing to get lower somehow. Um, like Mr. Tavel said, we're at about the same staffing we were at 40 years ago. It's about 1,300 sworn. And yet we've only added more people in the city, and we've only asked more of the police department. The SPD is currently a mile wide and an inch deep. They're doing uh, more, they have more responsibilities and fewer people to, to fill those responsibilities. So the key to uh, recruiting and retaining, it, also, it all starts with having a council that is supportive of law enforcement. Uh, that's the issue we're having with retention. It's not just the money. The officers just got to pay uh, a retro check last month, and they're still leaving. Um, it's about not feeling supported by your employer, not knowing how long you're going to have to wait for your next collective bargaining agreement, not knowing if you're going to happen to get into a shooting that you couldn't have anticipated two seconds prior and be criticized for that by the city council. And so it's it, it all starts with that support. Um, and a lot of officers are inspired that I'm running to try to uh, be a voice for them on city council. The support feeds into not only the retention, but the recruitment. There are, our officers are not currently telling their friends from out of state or even from Bellevue or Renton to come over to Seattle. They're talking to their friends, but how can I, how can I get to Everett? How can I get to the port? You know, so it's, it's uh, that's where it comes. It's 100% based on support. Once you have better staffing, the SPD becomes a more attractive place to work because you can get a day off, which would, Right now, officers are getting rejected for time off. They're not being able to go to uh, specialty unit assignments that they spent their careers trying to get to. Uh, it's hard on family. So it 100% comes down to a supportive city government. When I took the time to pull over in South Park uh, two weeks ago and talk to a police officer who was just sitting there, he said he didn't feel supported. And that officers were leaving, even though they're the best paid in the state. We do need to ensure that they feel supported. He said, I'm worried that my job actually doesn't mean anything. I'm not supported in City Hall. And I think the police department and even the fire department, when I met with Local 27, they don't feel properly supported by City Hall. That our budget continues to go up but they don't have the tools and resources to be successful. And this isn't me just putting it, this is their own words that they don't feel supported. We need to do better. But I'm also, I'm not a draconian law and order candidate. We've had issues with our police department. There's a reason the Justice Department issued a ruling. There's a reason that we as a people pass an initiative to say police officers do need to be held responsible. But that doesn't mean we don't support our police officers. All of us do. All of us want our communities to be safe. All of us want our kids to be safe. And they are an integral part, an absolutely essential part of what the city's duty is. It's to keep you safe. And so for me, we need to make sure that we do have the good police officers. We need to make sure that when they go after the dealers, the people that are dealing the death of opiates and methamphetamine downtown, when they arrest those individuals, that they get prosecuted and that they serve time. We need to ensure that they feel they feel supported, that we will look at it as complex as it is. It's not so black and white. We need good behavior from our police officers, and we're definitely moving in the right direction. But at the same time, we need a city council that does support public safety. So, you know, I can't argue with the feeling. If police don't feel supported, I'm sorry for that. But your city council has supported the police. The whole city council cannot be held accountable for the divisive rhetoric of a single council member. This city council has voted to expand funding from the police department from $300 million a year to $400 million a year in just three years. We, um, it, we funded $40 million in back pay to cover the period of time that we were um, negotiating um, the SPA contract. And, and the city is not the only party that is responsible 
for this Bob contract taking a long time. We were negotiating the things that were in the, the consent decree, the things that the federal government were, was requiring us to negotiate. But nevertheless, we paid $40 million worth of back pay. We support the police department. We just funded bonus, um, I'm sorry, um, um, recruitment uh, um, incentives for both lateral hires as well as, um, as well as new recruits. This police department, the starting salary is $81,000 a year and $106,000 a year after 54 months, and that does not even include overtime. You know, um, we, it's true, we absolutely need to increase the number of police officers that we have working on our streets. Um, we need to figure out how to address the recruitment issue. 80% of big city police departments have large numbers of agencies. This is a problem that is happening in every large city in the nation. And in our city, we have historically very low un unemployment. For instance, Amazon has right now 11,000 openings in Seattle. So this is a larger problem. We need to figure out creative ways to bring officers um, on board. And we also need to figure out ways to address the staffing that they're dealing with right now by doing things like restoring the community service officers program, which can take off some of the burden around um, the law enforcement responsibilities and let them focus on those things. Our next question is on transportation, and we'll start with Brendan Colvin. Public comment, stakeholders advisory group, and elected leadership have voiced overwhelming support for a tunnel rather than a racetrack here in District 1. Sound Transit has mentioned there is not enough funding for the tunnel and that additional public funds will be required. As council member, how would you balance the desires of the community with the budget of the city? Thank you. So the question, as I understand it, is how are we going to choose whether to have a tunnel or, a, or an elevated track based on budget. To me, the overwhelming desire of the community is to have a tunnel. And the reality is, once we, once we create whatever we ultimately create, it'll be there for at least 100 years. So we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to get this right. Um, and it's one of those things we can't afford to get wrong. It's not worth doing wrong to save money. We need to find resources. We need to be creative about finding uh, funding sources for this. Um, it, it's not something we, we can uh, be cheap with. The uh, West Seattle Junction uh, Neighborhood Organization has been very um, vocal in their support of a, of a tunnel, uh, the Purple Line. They've made a lot of great points about that. I personally support the Purple Line. Uh, something that I learned that I didn't know until I was uh, reading some literature from them is that uh, the West Seattle Junction area is actually currently underserved uh, in public park space. And that there's, they make a lot of strong arguments about how having a tunnel go under the junction and not right, and not have the, the train go right through it would allow for more creative use of the space we have and for more development, um, both residential and, uh, and business. So there, there's so much in terms of upside to having a tunnel. Possibly, in all likelihood, help generate more revenue than, a, than an elevated line would. That I, I just don't see the monetary uh, difference as being prohibitive in terms of getting the community what they want. Um, so I'm 100% pro tunnel, and that's what I'll support. Thank you. So. I can tell you that I am 100% behind the tunnel as well. I do want to tell you my road here because it was initially troubling for me to get there because of the price tag. I'm really pragmatic and I have a big issue with the way the city spends money. We went from $2.9 billion in revenue in 2011 to $5.9 billion of revenue this year. Our population hasn't doubled. We continuously spend more and more money for services, but do you feel that your services are twice as good or more than that? I really don't think we're there. But the reason I'm behind this project is that we need to build for the future. Affordable housing is very important to me. If we don't do the tunnel project and we do the raised elevated track, 
We're going to lose up to 120 housing spaces. We're going to lose small businesses. We're not building towards the future. This is a project that we are taking a look at, expanding in the future. I didn't hear a lot of gruff when South Lake Union decided to make two stations underground. I haven't heard a lot of gruff when the University of Washington understood that they needed to go underground. In West Seattle, we need that too. We have precious space. We can't get more of it. And so if we don't do the tunnel option, we are forever making the decision that we're giving up that space. And that needs to be a priority for us. Let's build our transportation options for the future and not just for today. This is a project that's going to benefit not just West Seattle, it can benefit beyond. So let's work with King County, let's work with Washington State, let's, let's get the tunnel option done. It's important. So as far as uh, Sound Chapter 3 and the, um, the West Seattle alignment, I um, too um, agree and support um, a tunnel for um, the junction. I also think that we need to look at alternative alignments to Delridge so that we are not um, having an elevated alignment right through a residential neighborhood. This would be um, unique for Sound Transit to, to have an elevated alignment through a densely populated um, residential neighborhood. And so it does actually turn into a lot of dollars when you're looking at um, potentially um, advocating for two tunnels in for West Seattle. We're talking $1.2 billion. And so we need to really begin to get serious about um, our city's transportation investments as well as negotiating with other stakeholders for third party, fourth party, fifth party funding as it relates specifically to the city's transportation investments. I'm going to get right back on my uh, shopping shuttle um, uh, stump and argue that the um, uh, that, that project has doubled in cost in just from just 2015, exactly doubled in, in the projected cost. It's not going to meet its ridership. And we could use that about $130 million that we have earmarked for that project to invest in that third party funding so that we can deliver an alignment to West Seattle that meets the needs of our community, allows us to deliver open space to the junction, allows us to preserve the kind of infill, dense neighborhood community housing um, that exists in West Seattle and ensures that we aren't, um, you know, I, I, I really feel strongly that if we're talking about a tunnel in the junction, we need to really be thinking about our alignment in Delridge as well, because again, the, the, the displacement impacts in that neighborhood are, I, I think, really serious and we need to take it seriously as a matter of equity. This is an incredibly important issue. In fact, I was at uh, Joe McDermott's kickoff and someone had said to him that this is an issue that is going to affect us for a generation and he jumped on it and said, no, this is, an, this is going to affect us for a hundred years. And it's true. And the fact is, we just took down the viaduct. One of the reasons people stated for that is to move the barrier between downtown and the waterfront. And now the conversation is to put a barrier twice that size running right through the middle of West Seattle. Now, we're only at the point right now where we want to get the purple line back on the table for the environmental impact statement. So we haven't started building it. We haven't decided what we're going to do yet. We're just studying it. Now, I've been to several of the outreaches from Sound Transit talking about the purple line and talking about the other lines. And what I find fascinating is they're only about 5% into the process, which is what they state, in terms of determining what this is going to really cost. Yet, they took the purple line off the table because they said it was just going to be way too much money. Well, when they were confronted with the question of, if you can only tell us within 5% certainty, what are the costs of the other lines, then how could you take that one off the table since you don't know the total cost yet? I mean, we've already seen one of the options went up by $200 million while they were studying it, and they're still not finished. So, for me, it's a very simple question. If it is possible, in terms of engineering, to run the tunnels and to have underground light rail come to West Seattle, then it's not a question. We do it. We find a way. We work with the port. We work with other businesses. We find other funding to make that happen. But we, at this point, we just need to get it back onto the table for something for us to study. And again, you know, we're talking about open space and green space. 
Think about the impact on a neighborhood of taking out part of Pigeon Point, taking out houses, putting this structure down the middle of our businesses, right through the middle of where we live, the, the disruption we would have to the businesses we have now, and the destruction of the community. We can't let it happen. We need the purple line back on the table. Thanks again, everybody. Our final question for the evening is on homelessness. When Seattle set out to rarefy homelessness, it had three goals in mind. Prevent more households from falling into homelessness. Use emergency programs to efficiently connect people with services and temporary housing. And produce and get people into permanent affordable housing. How effective has Seattle been in meeting these goals? And how will you move Seattle forward in addressing homelessness? And we will start with Jesse. Thank you. Well, I hope I've been clear that this is the number one issue, in my opinion, and I believe in a lot of people's opinion, that's facing Seattle. If you were to rate Seattle, I don't know how you can rate that they're doing a good job. We spend a lot of money and we continuously have an ever-growing population of homelessness. We need an individualized approach to homelessness. When we were homeless, the needs of somebody who's escaping domestic violence is vastly different than people who are aging out of the foster care system. The needs are great, and we need to understand what those are. We do have some effective tools. The navigation team is a fantastic job. They do a fantastic job of finding the core issues of the individuals that they're working with and supplying them with solutions that they need. But I can tell you, we need to do better. You know, I'm going to give Joe McDermott another shout out that was just, he just got, got another uh, shout that at the Young Democrats, the King County Young Democrats, he talked about a solution being pushed to the front by Dow Constantine by Christine Gregoire, where we are to create an agency on a King County level basis for us to oversee our homeless response. If we can't measure, if we don't have transparency in the way that we spend our money right now, how can we come up with a better way to do it? I can't run a, my business without having have full transparency in the way I spend my money and the outcome that comes out of it. And we need that in this city. We need to work together with our neighboring communities. Because homelessness is not, it's not a Seattle problem. We see it, it's very, very open to all of us. This is a regional problem. We need to partner with our region so that we can come up with regional solutions to this. Thank you. So, um, you know, Seattle can do better. Absolutely. We are moving more people more quickly out of homelessness into permanent housing than we ever have before. I sponsored legislation a couple years ago um, when I was chairing the budget process that would, requires HSD to use results-based accounting, um, results-based accountability in its contracting decisions. The um, our investments, there is transparency about, around, around our investments. You can go to the All Home website and you can see the outcomes of every organization that, that we fund. But again, we need to do more. We know it works. And we need to do what works and we need to ramp it up. We need to build more um, enhanced shelter. Enhanced shelter is the kind of shelter that people want to go to, want to come off of the streets and go to. The navigation team actually is having a very, very difficult time moving people off the streets into housing. But you can see that when there are, not, that when there are enhanced shelter beds available, people accept them. We also need to build what's called permanent supportive housing that is based on the model of housing first. Permanent supportive housing is the kind of housing that people will accept no matter what their situation is, whether or not they have a mental illness or they have a substance abuse problem. This is the kind of housing that people accept. 98% of people who are offered supportive housing accept it, and 97% stay in and remain housed after two years. We need to do what we know works, and we need to do more of it, and we need to treat this like a crisis.
So I don't think the city's done a very good job. 2005, we ushered in a regional 10-year plan to end homelessness, and that's 14 years in now. And what you can say is that at the end of that, in 2015, the numbers were actually leveling out, but over the last four years, they've gotten worse. And I don't think we know what works. And part of the reason for that is I don't think we do a very good job tracking the results we're getting from the providers that deal with this issue. You know, it's not just about affordable housing. The fact is, the biggest problem here is undiagnosed, untreated, unsupported mental health issues and substance abuse issues. However, housing is clearly a big part of that as well but also the criminal justice system. One of the things that I want to see happen is I want to have a transitional program so that when people who are released from jail who are homeless go into a program where they can continue to deal with mental health issues and substance abuse issues, they can work on getting some type of vocational training and they can get into some type of permanent housing. But if we don't start by having the safety net within the criminal justice system, being able to provide more affordable housing across the city is great, but if you don't have those wraparound services, if you don't provide community, if you don't provide the ability for people to actually take themselves out of that situation and move forward, which is with a job, with community, with hope, and dealing with some of these underlying issues, we're going to continue to have this problem. And so one of the things we really need to do is we need to hold the providers more accountable for this, that if they're not showing that they're transitioning people out of you know, temporary housing into permanent housing, then other people need to have that money. If we're not seeing the proper results with people actually changing their behaviors and not being repeat offenders, or not staying in of substance abuse issues, we need to find better ways to deal with that. And I think at this point, we need new solutions. We need new ideas, and we cannot continue on this same path, because right now this is a path to failure, and we need to change it now. Everybody's getting tired. <laughs> Thank you. So, I think if you look around downtown, you can tell we have not been effective with homelessness, and our current approach just simply isn't sustainable. We have people living in tents on the street, we have people living in tents under I-5, we have people living in tiny villages without an exit strategy. And I'm very concerned that we're creating somewhat of a caste system in the city of Seattle where people do where that's the kind of the, the bottom rung, and we could do a lot better than that. Um, what I want to do is create a, um, a regional network of immediately available transitional housing. Some of this will be working with our current partners. Uh, there was actually an article in the Times earlier today about the enhanced shelters that, that we've contracted with that are seeing some pretty good results. Not as good as we might like, but we can work towards that. We can also erect something that would look at my mind like a FEMA-style tent throughout, this, throughout the region, not just within the city, but without the region. I think it's a, a King County uh, level program, uh, and we need a triage process to direct people to the appropriate facility. I think we would have certain facilities for people with uh, mental illness, for people with substance abuse issues, people who are simply down on their luck and need a place to stay for their night, uh, domestic violence uh, victims, uh, people with pets, families, each have different needs. We need to plug them into the appropriate services where they're comfortable and where they can get what they need. Um, so the, the first step, obviously, is to guarantee that to people. Until we can guarantee these services to people, we're, we're stuck with the status quo. Uh, that's the carrot. The other part that I'm perfectly upfront about is the other side is the stick. Uh, we need to be able to enforce our laws if people won't take advantage of the opportunities they have or there isn't um, a way to, to commit an involuntary treatment. That involves supporting our police department and having the political will to once we guarantee the better option to people, to hold them accountable to the laws that govern our society. Thank you.
it um, is such a huge responsibility. I'm, I'm um, always invigorated by the good that can be done and um, challenged by how much more there is still to do. I love this city. I love our district. I love working with you. I have a fantastic team who really puts a premium on delivering constituent services. Used to be, council members didn't really work on constituent services. We spend at least half of our time working on constituent services, whether or not that's getting an abandoned building in your neighborhood boarded up because it's a derelict eyesore that attracts crime, or getting the lights repaired on a street that has been um, the target of a lot of assaults. We've worked on um, adjusting people's water bills. The whole getting somebody's cat down off of a utility pole. I believe that when I work with you to deliver constituent services, that we can build more confidence in our government. And when we build more confidence in our government, we can accomplish more. And that's really my vision for serving you. I really hope I get the chance to do it again. And I want to say that 30 years of public service and three years as an elected official does not make me a career politician. So it's simple. Seattle can do better. You can't tell me that in a city that generates almost $6 billion a year in tax revenue that we can't do a better job providing services and help for people. Yes, it's about compassion, but we've reached a point where we're only looking at one side of so many issues. And I know the homelessness issue is the biggest thing in front of us, and that is the most important thing we have to tackle because it's just wrong. Anyone spending the night outside on the street, especially in the conditions that we have thousands of people living in right now, is inappropriate. That is not compassion. We need to find a way to help them. And as I said before, this is a multi-pronged issue. It's about law enforcement, it's about the criminal justice system, it's about mental health support, it's about substance abuse support, it's about providing people with the money they need to stay in housing, it's all of those things. But remember, this is also a district election. And the fact is, the big city issues are there and we need to work together. There's a group of nine people on council where we will have at least four new members of that this year, and there'll be a chance to attack this with new <laughs> solutions to these problems. But there's also District 1 issues. There's filling potholes, there's getting roundabouts and crosswalks, there's supporting our businesses rather than increasing the fees that they have to pay and making their life difficult. We need to do several things in this city right now. One of the things we need is we need improved civic outreach to people where we actually listen to everybody in the city, not just the people who are yelling the loudest. We need to understand the numbers. We need to look at the budget and understand what do we get as taxpayers for the money we put in, because at this point, I don't think we do. And the last one is to work collaboratively with people. We need to embrace the businesses in our neighborhood. We need to embrace the people and not demonize them. There's so much that we can do, and we need change right now. And that's what an election is about. An election is about bringing people in for new public service who can do more. My name is Philip Tavel, and I ask for your vote, and I'm going to ask for your endorsement when we get there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. I'd like to circle back to the, my main concern, which is what inspired me to enter this race, is that we are in crisis. The city of Seattle is in an unprecedented crisis. Watch Seattle is Dying by Eric Johnson. Read System Failure by Scott Lindsay. Um, so the question is, how do we get to these points of crisis? And I'll tell you what the answer to that question is, is policy decisions that have come out of City Hall for the last several years have not been in line with our true values as a community. In Seattle, we take a lot of pride in saying that we're, that we're liberal, that we're blue, that we're left, which is, true, which is true, but for the longest time, we've allowed a very small group of people to define what that means. When I get out into the community and I talk to people, a lot of what I hear is, well, I'm left, but, you know, I, I want to see the police support the law. Well, I'm a Democrat, but our prevailing values are very much in line with the solutions that I'm attempting to implement here. People want to see the laws enforced. They want to see smart government. And this is consistent with a liberal society. I studied political science at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level. I taught political science for about six years as an adjunct at a local university. One of my favorite political uh, theory readings that I like to discuss is Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, 
where he discusses uh, man choosing, and this is a choice that man makes, to exit the state of nature, which is necessarily nasty, brutish, and short, and enter into the civil society. And what man gets out of that is protection from the government in exchange for following the laws. And that's actually one of the initial works in what has become known as liberal political theory. So it's consistent with our values as a city to enforce the law, to hold people accountable, to offer more, to offer services, uh, and to make change. And so that would be that would be what I would consider to be smart government. That's why I'm running. My name is Brendan Paulding, and I'd like to very much sincerely thank you all for coming out tonight. I would like to thank all of the candidates being here, and I would like to thank for the 34 Thames for hosting this. Um, I very much agree. I appreciate all of you. For everyone who took the time to come out here to put their name in the hat, there's a lot to this public service. And I know everyone here does have a good heart, but we all do have different, a different direction that we believe is the right way for Seattle. I, I believe the Founding Fathers never meant for civic duty to be your only career. I believe there's politicians that go into it to be their entire lives. I'm not a politician. I've never ran for office before. And it's weird using that as a selling point, but that's what it is. What I want to tell all of you is what kind of person do you want in City Hall? If, if the electorate really wants change, who do they want? And for me, if you want to vote for somebody that has real lived experience, somebody who works on homelessness for the last few years, that actually is cutting scars at the Low Income Housing Alliance, that is working in food banks, that is working with them, I have that experience. If you talk about economics of the city and about job creation and supporting small business, I run small business. I support small business. They're the incubators. They help, they help us combat classism. I care about this community, and I really feel, I really feel fortunate to have fallen in love with everybody here in West Seattle. So right now, this is being hosted by the 34th Democrats. So this is a big question for all of you. Who do you want to support? You? We have the opportunity, we're very fortunate, to send two people on to represent you in West Seattle and in South Park. So I ask you, I would love to represent you, and I would love to be your voice in City Hall. My name is Jesse Green. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for coming. I know you all put in a lot.